Before we begin this episode of Eternal Ethics, I want to make a request. Our organization, Torch, is a nonprofit organization. We are only supported by the generosity of our friends, of our donors, of our supporters, of our listeners. If you want to support our organization, if you enjoy this podcast and the many other podcasts that our organization offers, go right now. To the website is givetorch.com. We have compressed an entire year's worth of fundraising into one day. And my hope is that on this one day, we can cover the expenses of the entire year. So that way, the 364 days of the year that we do our amazing work, our amazing teaching, connecting Jews and Judaism, the amazing rabbis, sending students to Israel, etc., we can be covered. Again, the website is givetorch.com. You could pause the podcast and... It'll take a minute. Every donation is quadrupled. It's an amazing opp- opportunity to support the good work of Torch. Thank you for your support, and thank you for listening to the Eternal Ethics Podcast on Perky Avos. We're up to Chapter 3, Mishnah 15. Rabbi Alazar Hamodai Omer. Rabbi Alazar of Modi'in says, and he's going to list five things, Hamechalel Esakachim, Someone who desecrates the sacred things, vahamivaze esamoados, or someone who disgraces the festivals, vehamalbin prechavera berabin, someone who whitens the face of his friend publicly, someone who causes him to be embarrassed and his face flushes and then whitens, vahamayfer briso shel Avraham avinu, and someone who nullifies the covenant of Abraham, our forefather. That's a reference to the covenant of the circumcision. Someone who propounds interpretations of the Torah that are contrary to the halacha. So these are five things. Even though someone who does one of these five things may have in his hand, to his credit, Torah and good deeds, he has no share in the world to come. So he, Rabbi Lezer Madai is going to list five different things, either things that people do or characteristics that regardless of someone's good deeds and Torah would render a person ineligible for Olam Abba, which is, of course, uh, maybe the most severe punishment by Jewish standards, the idea of eternity being cut off from eternity, Olam Abba, the next world, the afterlife, they're locked out. So there's a few things uh, to tell about Rabbi Lazar Madai before we get into the nature of these five things. What do these five things mean? What's their connection? What's the overlap? What's the common theme here? Uh, why are these things rendered so severely? So, of course, he's from Modi'in, and it's a very famous city in, in Jewish history. Uh, the origin of the Maccabees, the family that orchestrated the Hanukkah revolt against the Greeks, they were from Modi'in. And it was a very important city in in Judah, in the land of Israel. Now, in the Talmud, we are taught a fair amount of teachings from Rabbi Elazar Modai. It seems like he preferred the Agadic portions of Torah. Agadic is a name for the non-Halachic parts of the Torah. Uh, so, for example, uh, the Talmud, the book of Yoma, page 76a, brings a discussion regarding how much manna fell every day. It's a whole page dealing with manna. So one of those discussions is, well, how much, well, how much manna was there every day? Well, you know, was there, you know, dusting of manna? Was there a foot of manna? So comes along Rabbi Lasmadai and he says something that everyone gets totally puzzled by. He says the manna that fell from heaven every day was 60 amos tall, roughly 120 feet of manna every day. It's a lot of manna. And the whole – everyone who – all the sages that are there with him are trying to figure out where does this come from? How how did you say something so preposterous? And he co- goes on to explain a very long and complicated proof from the height of the water of the flood and the words the Torah uses to describe the height of the water of the flood – and that he compares to the height of the manna, and he comes along with this conclusion, 60 amos, uh, 60 cubits, 
you know, more than 100 feet of mana. He does not opine on how wide it was or how they had to navigate. You know, like you have those big snowstorms in Buffalo and you have to carve out a little way to walk to your car and there's just mounds of white stuff on either side. So it, it's it's a very uh, unusual picture, not one that we're used to think of the mana, but this is one of the teachings of Rabbi Lazar Modai, uh, just an interesting thing that we see here in the Talmud. Of course, the Talmud talks about it and what does it mean and, and the commentary talk about, you know, what's the, you know, what's the possible lesson for us uh, to be taught about this uh, staggering uh, skyscrapers of mana. But regardless, that's just an example of one of the many teachings uh, that the Talmud brings. And again, uh, he is an expert in Agatha. In fact, there was a discussion about Agatha, about non-Halakha teachings. And uh, one of the great sages says, well, we need Rebbe Madai. He, he's the expert. He can help untangle this uh, Agathic matter. Now, Rebbe Madai is most famous for his role in the Bar Kokhba revolt. So we know the temples destroyed uh, around the year 70 of the Common Era. Temple stood for 420 years by the Jewish count. Uh, incidentally, by the Jewish count, it was destroyed the year 68. By secular counts, the year 70. Close enough for us, going back two thousand years. It's the same ballpark. But the temple's around for 420 years. It's refurbished by Herod. The Romans come about 100 years or a little more than 100 years. The Romans oversee the land. Eventually, there's the Great Revolt and there's the Siege of Jerusalem. And we meet uh, Vespasian and Titus. And, and eventually, the temple is destroyed and Jews move out of Jerusalem. The, the Sanhedrin moves to Yavne. We've talked about a lot of the great sages of Yavne in, in Pirkei Avos and the chapters of the fathers uh, hitherto. Uh, Rabbi Gamaliel and Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Akiva. And then we have kind of the next generation, the next generation of, of sages and the next change in attitude from the Romans. Uh, and we have uh, a Trajan and then eventually Hadrian, and there's a certain intensification uh, of, of the persecution that the Jewish people are facing thanks to their Roman overlords. And then in the year 117, Hadrian becomes emperor, and he is viewed in Jewish history as one of the villains. You know, he's up there with Pharaoh and Nebuchadnezzar and Antiochus and uh, Haman, one of these people that really tries to undermine uh, the basis of, of of Jewish life and uh, to really disrupt and upend what uh, what we could do and makes all these very difficult rulings. Uh, we spoke about Rabbi Judah the Prince and his little baby. You weren't allowed to be circumcised and can't study Torah publicly. And eventually that leads to the revolt of Bar Kokhba. And Bar Kokhba launches a revolt and is quite successful, at least initially. And Rabbi Kiva is the one who thinks he's going to be the Messiah and he manages to actually kick out the Romans and they, they conquer very vast swaths of land. And But eventually the Romans rearm and they come back and they systematically eliminate resistance and eventually the Jews of the resistance are holed up in the city of Betar and the siege ensues, and after a multi-year siege, the siege is broken, and on the ninth day of Av, that terrible day of Jewish history, the whole city is slaughtered, it's terrible devastation, both Jewish sources, the Talmud and others, and non-Jewish Roman sources, Deo Cassius, talking about the devastation and the slaughter that's uh, unfathomable, let's say it's a uh, Holocaust-like uh, destru- uh, uh, destruction and slaughter, uh, like the Talmud says, for example, what happened after the downfall of Betar, just to give a little uh, um, macabre uh, tidbit from the Talmud, it says that there were such rivers of blood of the victims that the Gentile farmers didn't need to fertilize their field for seven years. Just a, a terrible description, again, that's agreed upon by Jewish and Roman sources. But Rabbi Elazar Hamodai... He is an elderly, venerated sage at this time. And the leader of the revolt, Bar Kokhba, known uh, eventually as Bar Koziva, he is his nephew. So Rosamund is the uncle and Bar Kokhba is the nephew. Bar Kokhba is a, is a mighty warrior, a great Torah sage, and he had in his corner a lot of the great rabbis. But eventually, according to Jewish sources, his success got to his head. And he kind of told God, you know what? I don't need your help. I got this. Just don't help my enemies. And his hubris got to him and eventually started losing. And then he went a little par- paranoid. And that's 
the story, the most famous story about Rebbe Zemandai. So they're all holed up in the city of Beitar, and a three and a half year siege of the city uh, was undertaken by Hadrian and his army. And every day in the city, Rebbe Zemandai is praying, beseeching God to not allow this impasse to end, to not allow the siege to be broken, to not allow Hadrian from actualizing his plans. And eventually, Hadrian got sick and tired of the siege. This is what we're told in the Midrash. And he was about to leave. But one of the Kutim, and Kuti is the name, the Jewish name for the, we know it as the Samaritans, not the good ones, but the bad Samaritans. A Kuti told Hadrian, don't leave. I, I have a plan and I'll give you the city. So he snuck into the city. So these Tutis, they, they were kind of nominally Jewish, but they were really still uh, enemy combatants. And he walked into the city, and, and Rabbi Lezer Madai is praying. And he goes over to the rabbi who's praying, and he whispers something into his ear. And the people see this Kuti, who's kind of like maybe viewed as a traitor, and he's whispering something into the rabbi's ear. So they quickly arrest him, and they bring him to Bar Kokhba. And they ask him, well, what do you tell him? He says, well, I told him military secrets. I was kind of whispering military, maybe treasonous information. So Bar Kokhba calls in his uncle and asks him, well, what did he tell you? He wanted to investigate the matter for. So he says, well, he told me nothing. He just whispered nonsense to the mayor while I was, while I was praying. And Bar Kokhba, in a fit of paranoia, uh, and suspecting uh, treachery and treason, he struck his uncle and he killed him. And that, that was the kind of the last straw. He lost the rabbis and he lost his divine protection. He lost his, his greatest ally. It's the irony, right? His greatest ally, his uncle, the one that assured that he had the rabbi's support and the one who prayed every day that his mission su- should be successful. He lost him. And the Midrash concludes, a heavenly voice proclaimed, you killed Rabbi al Modai, the strong arm the right and the right eye of Israel. Therefore, your arm shall wither, your right eye shall grow dim. Eventually, Betar fell to the Romans, Bar Kokhba was killed. And that uh, sad chapter of Jewish history concluded. Now, incidentally, there's a dispute in Jewish sources as to who killed Bar Kokhba. Was it the Jews who did it or was it the Romans? According to the opinion that it was the Jews, the Talmud says that this is what happened. Very interesting. There was a tradition that the Messiah is going to save the Jews, is going to have special powers. And the tradition was that you would be able to judge by smell alone. So the two litigants would come to the court and the judge would just sniff around and that would be enough. That was a tradition. So once kind of Bar Kokhba showed his true colors, they, the Jew, the Jews said to him, okay, we're two litigants here, go smell away. And of course, his sniffing was uh, not at all effect, uh, effective and the Jews executed him as a false messiah, as a false prophet. That's one story. The other story is, the other opinion is that no, it was the Jews who killed him, the Romans brought the siege and they killed him. So that's the story of Rosa Madai and how he played a role in the Bar Kokhba revolt and its downfall. Now, incidentally, the whole Bar Kokhba narrative was found more, most prominently in, in Jewish sources and it was viewed more skeptically by the scholars until they discovered all kinds of stuff, uh, archaeological finds that prove conclusively that this actually happened. So they found, of course, military dispatches from Bar Kokhba. They found other documents from Bar Kokhba. They found a tefillin in caves. There's this great letter that they found Bar Kokhba sends to someone. Oh, we need a, the holiday of Sukkot is upcoming and we need a lul of an escort for the soldiers. Again, it's an army of, of religious Jews and they're fighting, but they need to have religious articles brought in uh, to, to the camp. They also found troves of coins that were minted. And what's interesting about these coins is that some on some of them it says uh, the name Rabbi Elazar HaKohen, Rabbi Elazar the Kohen. Many have suspected 
that Bar Kokhba's uncle, one of the great sages of the era, Rabbi Elazar Hamodai, is actually being referenced in those coins from the Bar Kokhba era. It's also interesting that on, at least on some of the coins, there is a depiction of the temple or of Jerusalem or of the altar, which has led some people to believe the following theory. So first of all, how long was Bar Kokhba revolt? It seems like, according to the consensus, that it was about three or so years. Some have suggested that it was a lot longer and it was a lot more successful. And most importantly, that they actually succeeded in at least putting a altar on temple grounds. Remember, they conquered Jerusalem, and this is very soon, relatively after the temple's been destroyed, it's 50 years afterwards. And the Jewish mindset, even today, but certainly then, was... We're going to rebuild the temple. You know, we know there's two temples down, one more to go, right? Bar Kokhba, he's successful in his revolt. Okay, what would they do? Isn't it natural they'd start planning? There is some evidence on the temple grounds itself that there was some sort of preliminary construction that was done to try to prepare for a temple. But again, the Talmud says that once you, if you want to restart the temple, all you need is an altar. So there is a theory and again, I don't know, I don't know anything conclusive about this, but there's a theory that actually Bar Kokhba not, was a much longer revolt, and uh, the, the time period is much longer, and it wasn't just, oh, he's going to be Messiah, but we'll wait to see that him deliver on the, uh, you know, on the promises, but he actually was successful in actually checking off a lot of those boxes, and most importantly, putting an altar and restarting sacrifices. So what would our present teaching, our present Mishnah, have to say regarding this theory? Now think about it. Rebbe died. we know when he lived. He died sometime around the year 130 or 135 or something something around that time. So 50, 60 years after temples destroyed. What's the first thing he lists in our Mishnah? Someone who defiles the holy. right? Someone who desecrates the sacred things. In Jewish literature, the sacred things is a reference to sacrifices. Why, why would Rabbi Elazar Hamadai list an extinct ritual or an extinct practice of desecrating the sacred amongst his Mishnah, his aphorism? It would seem that it's not very relevant in his life to talk about that because there is no temple, there is no sacrifices, there is no altar. However, if we accept at least the theory that maybe during the Bar Revolt there was an altar, and you would imagine that a lot of people would be very skeptical. First of all, they're skeptical of Bar Kokhba himself, and Rabbi Lazarus is, is a proponent of it, but also this would be a an altar without a temple, and you could see people saying, is this really an altar? Is this really legit? Are these sacrifices real? And you could see that there was a pattern of people defiling or repudiating or not according the proper respect to the sacrifices that were brought in that altar. And that would make a lot of sense. Again, I'm not saying conclusively one way or the other, but I think it is interesting that the very first thing that he lists amongst the five things that a uh, person – who does, uh, loses their portion of Allah is something that if there was no temple and there was no altar would be very impractical. You don't imagine, like, it wouldn't be something that would be relevant at all in the entire world. And it would be unusual for him to list that as something that's very important to announce to the world. Uh, however, if it was, if it is true that there was an altar and there were sacrifices, and you would imagine that a lot of people would look at it warily and they'll say, is this real? Is this a real sacrifice? This seems like it's, you know, this is a, a, a sham. This is a hoax. This isn't legit. This is not a real temple. This is just an altar. And therefore, such a, a teaching to kind of rein the people in would be very appropriate in such a world. But who knows? Again, this is a theory and uh, it's an interesting one. So that's a little bit about Rabbi Elazar Hamudai, and he's going to list five things that remove a person from Olam Abba. Now, it's important to stress that all of these are contingent upon someone not repenting. If someone repents from these things, then they would not still be in that category. These are things that are practices and activities that someone does, and Torah and good deeds will be insufficient to undo that ruling, however, repentance would work. What I want to do now, I want to run through these five things, understand what they are, and then offer several explanations about, 
you know, what the connection between those five themes are and what's the overall lesson. Cause it's, there's some fascinating stuff here that we see in the commentaries about what is actually going on in, in this Mishnah. So the first is someone who defiles the sacred things. Everyone seems to agree that this is a reference to sacrifices. And there are certain ways for people to sabotage sacrifices. Something called a pigrel, something called nosar. These are various activities in which someone can disrupt and sabotage a sacrifice. So for example, sacrifice is supposed to eat within a certain time period. You delay and you wait the time period has passed. You've defiled it. Uh, if you have an improper thought as a coin doing a sacrifice, you say, oh, I'm, I'm going to do something wrong with the various uh, procedures and processing of it. That would, again, invalidate the sacrifice. Uh, someone who uh, takes temple money, you go to the temple coffers and you use it you know, for your slush when you embezzle that money. All those things where there's a realm of the temple and the sacrifices and the sacrificial activities and someone comes and says, okay, I'm going to disrupt that. That would be uh, item number one. Item number two is someone who – uh, shames someone who disgraces the festivals and the commentaries are unanimous. This not really refer to the festivals itself. This refers to the intermediate days between the first and, and the last days of a festival. So for example, we have the upcoming holiday of, of, of Passover, of Pesach. You have the first two days, the last two days, and then you have the intermediate days, which are still Pesach, but it's not a, it's not a, it's not a holiday. It means you, there's no prohibitions of, of work, etc. Those are kind of the days in which people who do believe in the sanctity of the festival, but, but this one not, because this one's the intermediate days, that would be, uh, uh, item number two. Someone who whitens his fellow's face publicly. So the Ramam tells us this is actually someone who does this habitually. It doesn't mean someone who once in a while has uh, made someone embarrassed, uh, said an, an off-color comment, said a snide remark. That's not what it's referring to. It means someone who's always embarrassing other people publicly. That would be someone who is in this uh, in this category. Now, as we know, the Talmud does say very strong statements regarding someone who embarrasses someone else publicly. For example, famous Talmud, a book of Sota, page 10b, referring to the story of Judah and Tamar from, uh, I think it's chapter 38 of Genesis. Judah and Tamar, there is a uh, very unusual interaction that happens, uh, but it seems like uh, Tamar is justified, but Judah has her sentenced to death. And Tamar sends a coded message to Judah telling her of, telling him of his, of her innocence, but in a way that gives him the ability to accept it or not. And the Talmud tells us that even though Tamar was being condemned to be executed, she did not want to embarrass Judah. Says the Talmud, we learn a lesson from this, is it's better for someone to die, to be thrown into a fiery furnace, in the words of the Talmud, than to embarrass someone else's face publicly. And this is an idea that is referenced over here, that it's a really terrible thing that if someone uh, whitens their fellow's face publicly, it's so bad and the Talmud even says you have to give up your life to not do that. Now, the rationale behind this, just to get a little bit technical, we know that there's three cardinal sins that someone, from the Torah's perspective, must forfeit their lives to not transgress. And those are, of course, murder and um, adultery and other sexual crimes and idolatry. Now, the Talmud tells us a story in the book of Sanhedrin, so the Talmud uh, shares a story, which is the basis of this law, the idea you have to forfeit your life to not embarrass someone. And, you know, to us it makes sense. You have to forfeit your life to not kill someone, to not do a really terrible sin. What is the idea of not forfeiting, well, forfeiting your life in order to not embarrass someone? It's, yeah, you whiten their face publicly, but but so what? So the Talmud tells a story about a man. This is from the book of Sanhedrin, page uh, 75a. A man who had a crush, we'll call it, on a certain woman. And he got so infatuated with her that he got sick. And they went and they asked the doctors what to do. And the doctor said, this man will die. He's so love sick. He's so stricken by this woman. Unless he sleeps with her, he's going to die. So they go to the rabbis and they say, listen, the man's going to die unless he sleeps with this, with this woman. Is it okay? And the rabbis say, no, it's not okay. Let him die and not sleep with her. 
Okay, so the Gober to the doctors, is there anything else that we could do? Is there anything else that we could do to maybe have a hope to save this guy's life? So the doctor says, you know what? If he sees her naked, maybe that'll do the trick. So they go to the rabbit and say, well, is, is this okay? It's not going to be any sort of intercourse, but let, let, maybe this will do, will save the person's life. Save someone's life. What, 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 what will we do? And the rabbit say, no, let him die and let him not, uh, transgress this. We're not going to allow, uh, this to happen. Let him die. So they go back to the physicians and they say, is there anything else that we can do? Anything else? And the physician responds, you know what? If he has a deep, meaningful conversation with her, if they discuss, you know, if they have a discussion, maybe that will help and his lovesickness will be remedy. Uh, but, and even they can even do it, you know, with the wall separating them. Just a discussion, just a heart to heart. Maybe that will solve the problem. So of course they run back to the rabbis and they say, would this be allowed? You know, this is again, this is many degrees of removal from what we, they initially proposed, but maybe this will, will be enough. And the rabbis say, let him die and not speak to her from behind the fence. That's what the Talmud says. It's better for him to die, to not even do this level, so to speak, of relationship, to even speak to her behind the fence. And the Talmud says, well, what happened? Was she married or was she single? So according to one opinion of the Talmud, she was actually married. And therefore, of course, well, that, that's actual adultery. And even then there's adultery, but uh, you seen someone naked is, is still very private, but it's not adultery. And talking to them behind the fence, having a, a phone conversation, whatever, that's, that's, that's even more removed, but still it's too close to adultery and therefore it's off the table. And then the Talmud brings a different opinion. There's a second opinion of Talmud that no, she wasn't even married. She was single. And still the Talmud says that this is too much of a, uh, uh, uh of a violation of sexual misconduct. It's better for him to die and not to, uh, to do any of these things. So the Talmud concludes by asking the following question. Well, okay, well, if she is single, he's single, well, boy meets girl, it seems like there's nothing wrong with that, right? The Talmud says, well, let her, let him marry her and then he'll solve his problem. So the Talmud, no, it won't solve his problem. Why? It's, it quotes a verse in Proverbs, uh, forbidden waters are sweet and therefore the only way for him to solve his problem if it was done in some sort of prohibited fashion to some sort of violation of a certain rule that would quell his his pain and therefore marrying her won't solve the problem and therefore to do any sort of violations of the talmud that is in the sexual realm at all is something that this person even needs to to, to give up their life and not transgress that's the talmud now what does this tell us so some of the sages tell us that what the talmud is, is conveying is a a grand principle with respect to the idea of the three cardinal sins. Then when we're told three cardinal sins, you have to give up your life to not transgress, it's not just the sin itself, the kind of the, the, the greatest, highest and greatest representation of that sin. It's even things that are tangentially associated with that. It's an offshoot. It's, it has an element of these sins that would also be something you have to give up your life for. That's, the, that's how the, this Talmud is understood. Uh, certainly by some. It, like, it is a discussion, but certainly by some. And therefore, these activities, even though there are many degrees removed from a flagrant violation of, of a sexual sin, because it's related to it, even something like that, you'd have to forfeit your life. Ergo, just to extend this to, back to our case, a case of whitening someone's face publicly, says the Talmud, that is tantamount, or that is at least contains a scintilla of murder. Because their face is flushed, and for a second, their face is very red, and then then they turn white. All the blood leaves their face, and that is like, well, their face is devoid of blood. It's like death. Of course, it's not actual death, but it's like it. Just like, you know, talking to someone from behind the fence is kind of like uh, it's a violation in the same category, in the same stratosphere as adultery or as a sexual sin, so too this is in the same stratosphere as a, a sin of murder, and therefore Tamar was justified in, in giving up her life to not do that, and therefore it's such a severe sin, and therefore the Talmud could tell us it's preferable for someone to cast themselves in the fire furnace and not embarrass someone else publicly because this is a, in the realm of these three cardinal sins. So this is the idea here that we see that the, that murder is there's murder and then there's these sub-levels like whitening someone's face. And it's interesting 
that the Talmud does not say if someone commits murder, then they lose a portion of Amaba. But it does say if someone commits this level, kind of a spiritual murder, then that would be, which is an interesting thing to, to think about on the side. Now, there's a famous zinger in the Talmud uh, regarding King David. King David, as we all know, he had to live his whole life with the episode of Bathsheba, where some people said, you know, he committed adultery or he did murder, and and the Talmud goes to great lengths to prove that it wasn't technically adultery, it wasn't technically murder, but still it is something that was a sin. But the question is what the degree of sin is, and his whole life he's repenting for it. And that's, of course, one of the central episodes of, of David's life. So David was uh, also the greatest uh, sage, the Torah sage of his time, and uh, he was uh, sitting amongst the sages, and they would throw barbs at him and tell him, uh, uh, David, if someone commits adultery, how are they executed in Torah law? Which is a, it's an elementary question. Everyone knows it's a Mishnah. It's not a hard question to know, but they would do it just to embarrass him. So he would respond with the following zinger. He would say to them, their execution method is via asphyxiation, and they still have a portion in the world to come. But someone who whitens his fellow's face publicly does not have a portion in the world to come. That was his resounding zinger, and uh, and it quieted uh, the um, uh, the rabble rousers. Now, the next thing that is mentioned is someone who desecrates the uh, or violates the covenant of Abraham, which is explained by the commentaries to mean either someone who does not circumcise themselves or, or their children, or someone who is circumcised and go, undergoes the circumcision removal surgery to try to present themselves as uncircumcised. This was common during uh, the, certainly the Greek era, I think the Roman era as well. There would be a lot of um, activities were done in the nude and you don't want to be the only guy that are circumcised. So uh, if you had that proclivity, you maybe would be incentivized to undergo such a surgery and you're essentially repudiating the Abrahamic covenant and that's something that locks you out of Olam Haba, out of the next world. Now, there's a very deep point here. Someone who is part of the Abrahamic tribe, we're told, automatically has a ticket to heaven, with the exception of egregious sinners. Now, there is no prohibition, or at least no standalone prohibition, for someone to undo their circum- circumcision. It means to be circumcised. But there's, there isn't a lot of literature about not circum, not undoing the circumcision. But the point, the deep point is, is that the reason why we have a leg up, the reason why we're the chosen people, the reason why by default we are granted a golden ticket to Oma Ba is because of Abraham. He kickstarted the whole thing. Our whole nation's relationship with God, the whole like, reason why we have Torah, the reason why we have Israel, all that was began because of Abraham and embodied by this mitzvah, by the circumcision. Therefore, someone who divorces themselves, or someone says, I'm not interested in this, someone who cuts themselves away from the Abrahamic ritual, then they're just getting what they asked for. Okay, you don't want to be part of this fraternity. Part of the perks of this fraternity is to have a guaranteed ticket to Amaba. Someone who says, I'm not interested. Okay, if you're not interested, then that is your prerogative. Now, incidentally, I want to just share that the Talmud does tell us that there are other perks, which are kind of uh, eschatological perks that we get because of Abraham, and as embodied by the circumcision, the Talmud and the Midrash, uh, they tell us the following really interesting and provocative, uh, intriguing statement. It says that in the future, Abraham is going to be sitting at the doorstep of hell, of Gehenna. And every candidate is going to be inspected, it doesn't say it like that, but is going to be inspected to see if they're circumcised. And Abraham is going to use his clout and not allow someone who is circumcised to be admitted into, into, Hena, into hell, into purgatory. But what if someone is such a terrible sinner, such an egregious sinner, and they need to go in because they need to be purified, they need to be cleansed? Then what do they do after all they're circumcised? Says the Talmud, they have to find an artificial foreskin. And slap it on, and only that way can they be allowed, can they get past Abraham, so to speak, to be allowed into in, into heaven. Which means, that, again, this idea of the circumcision and its connection to Abraham, because, again, the, the mission does not talk about someone who does or reverse the circumcision. Someone repudiates the covenant of Abraham. What well, means that the, this is Abraham's mitzvah, 
And this is our connection, so to speak, to Abraham. This will make us part of the Abrahamic fraternity. And we're going to have Abraham as an advocate if we are part of his team. And if we embody this mitzvah, we have the greatest advocate, which is Abraham. Remember, Abraham almost saved Sodom and Gomorrah. If he almost saved Sodom and Gomorrah, he could save us, certainly, and be prevented from from being allowed. And that's what the Talmud says. And again, uh, I would say to uh, to uh, to someone in this Mishnah, you know, the this circumcision is not only our ticket to heaven; it's also our shield from punishment and uh, repudiate it at your own risk. We definitely want Abraham on our side, both for the good things that uh, that are included in 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 the fraternity and the bad things that are going to be prevented as a result. I, what the exact meaning behind this Talmud is? Again, it's a, it's a, I got a Talmud. You have to understand what the lesson is that's being conveyed and try to understand the, uh, the lingo and the style and the language in which it's conveyed. But definitely the lesson is Abraham is our advocate and this is our connection. This is what, um, bonds us to this covenant. Finally, we have the person who propounds interpretations of the Torah that are contrary to halacha. So there's a few explanations of what that means. According to some, it means someone who does sins brazenly in public with an outstretched arm and without any shame. Others explain that this is someone who gives uh, faux interpretations of Torah, meaning interpretations of Torah that are not according to halacha, but they're doing it for the sole purpose of either assuaging their cognitive dissonance or by advancing their own agenda Meaning they don't look at the Torah as being divine. They look at the Torah as being a tool that they can use to implement to try to get towards their agenda. Not trying to study the Torah, but trying to manipulate the Torah in a way that they find uh, suitable, uh, but not trying to unlock the divine wisdom inherent in it. So those are the five things. Someone, even though they may have Torah in many good deeds, they were to, they would lose their portion of Laba if they do the one of these five things. Now what I want to do now is trying to understand what's the connection between these five things, very five seemingly very random activities that are all lumped together. But the second we plumb a little bit deeper, we find that there's a uh, there's very deep connections between these five things. So first of all, all the commentaries point out that these five are about repudiating that that is holy. So the first one is someone who desecrates the holy. Obviously, sacrifices holiness and someone repudiates that, they reject that. The next one is festivals. Festivals are called Mikra'e Kodesh. These are callings of, of holiness. Someone who re- repudiates that is repudiating that element of holiness. Man is created in the image of God. Man is an element of holiness. Someone who shames man is, again, defiling the holy. The circumcision is a covenant of holiness. Someone repudiates that, repudiates holiness. And finally, the Torah, the divine Torah, is nothing more holy than that, and it's the holiness of the world, and someone who denigrates those holy things is locked out of the holy world, meaning olam haba. Now, the commentaries go on and explain that these are not just things that are holy that can be repudiated, but these are things that are holy that are lightly to be repudiated. There is grounds, or at least people may find grounds, to think that, yeah, there is holiness, but these things are not really holy. Each one of these items has something which would make someone think that it's not really so bad to reject them, to repudiate them. So, for example, is it really holy? You have a sacrifice. What is it? It's a cow. It's a sheep. Yesterday it was in my barn. Today I say it's a sacrifice and suddenly it's holy. That doesn't make any sense. It's not really holy. Similarly, we have the festivals. Well, the festivals... That is a function of the calendar. Well, who determines the calendar? It's the courts. These people are going to tell us when it's holy and if they decide the next day that's holy, is that really holy? Again, these are these are false questions. But again, that there are some grounds. There is room for people to uh, to to question the legitimacy of these holy things. Someone his face is whitened publicly. Is he injured? Is there lasting damage? Do you see a wound? Is it really something that I really reject something that was holy? Circumcision, a little minor a, a, a procedure that was done to a baby is something which is so holy. The, the, the Torah, I repudiate the Torah. I, I, I make up my own interpretations. 
Did I, did I harm the Torah? Did I take the throne and throw it on the ground, God forbid? Did I rip it up? Did I burn it? I just said my own, my own opinion. Can't I have my own opinion? Did I really denigrate the whole, again, there's, there's grounds. These aren't, what, what we're told here is that this is not someone that rejects the whole thing, the whole concept of the whole, of holiness wholesale. It just says, well, there is holiness. This is just not it. And therefore comes along, Rabbi Lazar Montaigne says, no, no, this is it. Don't make that mistake. With the time we have left, I want to share with you two fascinating perspectives from the Maharal. And he wants to suggest, along uh, the first interpretation, we'll get to the second one in a second, which is a little bit next level, as we shall see. He wants to say, along these lines that we said just uh, until now, that there's this, again, idea of holiness, but these are these are things which are not holy. So he explains that these five themes are the attitudes of a very special, spiritual person. This is the key. He says, there is a kind of person that eschews anything earthly. There's no spirituality in anything earthly. This is what we would call monasticism or asceticism. Someone's like, there's the spiritual plane, there's the physical plane, and the two shall never meet. Nothing physical, nothing earthly, nothing mundane can be elevated to the level of holiness. He sees a sacrifice. You're taking a sacrifice and you're offering it to God as if God needs to eat. What do you mean? God's entirely spiritual and has no interest in the physical realm. Festivals. What happens at a festival? He's not talking about Yom Kippur. This person loves Yom Kippur. You act like an angel. It's just spiritual. But then the rest of the festivals, we're told, the Talmud says, you have to have, you have, to have meat. You have to have wine. You have to enjoy. You have to dine. It's something which is very physical, very mundane in this person's eyes. And therefore, that's why he repudiates it. Similarly, he looks at the circumcision. God is going to stamp his covenant in that location, the location that maybe is the most base or is home to the most base of, 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 of earthly lusts. Can't be that there's holiness over there. Whiten someone's face publicly. This person, this human, he's got a body. He's got, he's got desires. He's got earthly desires. He eats, he drinks. This is not something which is a vessel of holiness. There's no problem whitening their face publicly. The Torah, what does the Torah say? There's some mitzvahs in the Torah that are spiritual mitzvahs, but there's all kinds of mitzvahs that are physical mitzvahs. Those mitzvahs can't be holy. And therefore, propounding laws in the Torah against Allah, because the Torah does say those things, and those things are true, and they are spiritual, but this person who wants to be the ascetic, wants to be the monastic one, wants to view spirituality as siloed off from the world, Someone like that who wants spirituality says, or Muslim would die, well, you're locked out of spirituality. And that's the best kind of punishment. You think that you're going to be able to live in this entirely spiritual utopia? You're going to live in Olam Abba? If you're, if you're going to denigrate this, the, the Torah in effect and try to use that as a way to get to the spiritual world, you'll never get, you'll never get there. And that's apt punishment. And then he concludes this point by saying that there's a proper balance. You know, there's some things that are physical that are not okay, that are not spiritual. And some parts where the two meet. And there's a fusion of a spiritual component to a physical activity or practice. And that is to be encouraged. And the festivals, when we, when we celebrate the festivals, we have the meat and the wine. It's a mitzvah. And that's the proper balance. Follow what the Torah says. And therefore you'll, ha- you'll be guided towards, uh, towards the right path. That's the first interpretation. I think a very deep idea that we see here that there is spirituality, there is eternal value as the Torah guides us in the physical world. And don't try to be a, a monastic. Don't be a, an ascetic. Don't be someone who wants to divest themselves from this world. That's not the way. That's this guy's attitude. You won't end up in Olam Abba via that, that path. And finally, the Maharal shares, I found this so fascinating. I've been thinking about this ever since I, I saw it uh, a week and a half ago. He says that these five things are five different levels of spirituality. And he explains, he says there's different world, what he calls different worlds. There's worlds in ascending order. There's the lowest world, then there's the next world, and then the next two, which are two halves of one whole, and then the top world. And different gradients of spirituality. And he says like this, what, what's the first, the first item in the list is someone who denigrates the sacrifices. What, what's a sacrifice? You take an animal. It's animalistic. It's the lowest thing. And you make it holy. That's showing holiness in the lowest 
world. And then there's a higher world, what he would call the orbitary world. And that's festivals, which based upon the orbitary planetary constellations, that's a higher realm and that's the holiness there. The idea of the calendar that we're being governed uh, time-wise at least by the calendar, that's a higher level and that's the holiness that's found there. And then he says, man, what's man? Man is a world unto his own because man is half spiritual, half physical. It's not either one. It's not animalistic. It's not orbitary. It's not even the highest level. It is its own unique entity. And therefore, man is broken down to two parts. There's the body and then there's the soul. The holiness in the body, well, that's the circumcision. The holiness of the soul is the fact that we're creating the image of God. That like our image, our visage is similar to God. What that means, of course, is a big question, but that's the point. And therefore, the holiness in our body, in that realm, is the circumcision. And the holiness in the spiritual half of ours, well, that's the fact that we, you know, we're creating the image of God and someone repudiates that. Again, they're violating the holiness of those two worlds. And finally, the highest level is the holiness of, of the Torah, and that is, comes from the entirely spiritual world. So he says that there's, there's essentially four or five, depends on how you count, worlds. There's the, the, the lowest world, uh, I would call it the mundane world. Uh, there's the intermediate world, which is like the orbitary world. There's the highest world, which is the, the, the apex of spirituality. And then there's man, who is a world unto himself, which is a hybrid of the highest and of the lowest, half animalistic and half entirely spiritual. And each one of these themes are the holiness captured in that world. And then he says something fascinating. And again, I encourage everyone to think about this because he tells us to think about it. And I'm still thinking about it because it doesn't really make sense to me. I, I don't really understand it. And he says, if you look at the Mishnah, there's a progression. You start with the lowest level and you kind of are laddering up, stairway to heaven. And he says, this is the guidance to get to Olam Abba. What he tells us is that there's a process. You start the lowest rung, you find holiness in this world. You find holiness in a higher world. You find holiness in yourself. You find hol- holiness and, until you're actually in heaven. And that's the key to get to heaven. And it's almost like a ladder where you're laddering up from the lowest level to the highest level. And once you get there, well, then you're there. Whereas someone who refuses to take this ladder, refuses to find the holiness in these worlds, does not actually climb that ladder, never gets to the top. And that's why, of course, if he's not there, He's not there, and it's not a surprise that he loses his portion in Olam Abba. Very fascinating and deep idea that we see here. And uh, again, in conclusion, we have the great sage, Rabbi Zim Amudai, uh, lived at a very tumultuous time and gave us these five things, seem to be random, that if someone does them and does not repent, they lose a portion of Olam Abba. And the, the overarching theme is that there's holiness everywhere. There's holiness in this world, in the spiritual world, in the variety of worlds, a variety of realms, and we have to try to find that holiness, seize it, and not repudiate it. And by doing that, we're connecting ourselves to holiness, we're cleaving to holiness, and we're giving our soul uh, its uh, power to have continuity uh, for eternity in Olam Abba. Whereas if we lock ourselves out of holiness, if we reject it for arms, arms, legs, we're not willing to embrace the holiness, well, okay, you get what you asked for. If you want to reject the holiness, then you will be locked out of holiness, and uh, that will be very unfortunate.